The year 1966 saw President Johnson inspecting US troops in South Vietnam as they were drawn ever deeper into the war. Prime Minister Henrik Fevort of South Africa, one of the creators of apartheid, is buried after being stabbed to death. In Britain, Prime Minister Harold Wilson leads the Labour Party back to power with a greatly increased majority. Storm clouds soon gather over the economy. But the nation rejoices as England beats West Germany 4-2 in the World Cup. A few weeks later, on the 31st of August, there was a funeral in West London. Three policemen were being buried after being shot down in cold blood. Nothing rouses more anger and determination in a police force than the murder of one of its own. Perhaps because this is well known among criminals, fewer than 40 members of the Metropolitan Police have been murdered in this century. But when a member has been a victim, the force does not rest until the killers have been punished. One of the most famous occasions was in 1911 when two sergeants and a constable were killed during a raid on a jeweller's in the city of London. The killers were anarchists who were cornered in Sydney Street and killed when top-hatted Home Secretary Winston Churchill brought in armed police and the army. In 1927, the murder of PC Gutteridge in an Essex Lane started another mass hunt. The gun was found months later in the garage of a car thief, Frederick Brown. When his accomplice, William Henry Kennedy, confessed, both of them went to the gallows. In 1948, PC Nathaniel Edgar was shot in Southgate by a man he was questioning. As he lay dying, he wrote a name in his notebook. The killer, Donald Thomas, was caught in bed with his mistress when their landlady saw his photo in the paper. The most famous murderer of a policeman in London did not hang. At 16, Christopher Craig was too young. But his 19-year-old partner, Derek Bentley, who shouted, let him have it, Chris, was executed. The public outcry hastened the end of hanging in Britain. But abolition came too late for the murderer of Sergeant Purdy in 1959. He was Gunter Padola, traced while making a blackmailing phone call. He shot his captor and ran away. Caught through the fingerprints he left, he was executed at Wandsworth Prison. It was seven years later when Britain's biggest ever manhunt began after the three policemen had been shot down in Shepherd's Bush. They were part of a team that had just been released after a long inquiry into a murderer of local prostitutes nicknamed Jack the Stripper. The inquiry had ended with the suicide of the chief suspect and now they were back on routine patrol. In charge of the team was Detective Sergeant Christopher Head, aged 30 and unmarried. He had just been promoted to sergeant. David Woomwell had two children and after three years on the force had only recently been made a temporary constable. The third was PC Geoffrey Fox, a father of three, whose wife later said, I always knew my Jeff would get killed someday. They were patrolling in West London in a Q car, a Triumph 2000. In the vicinity, there was another car, also with three men in it. John Edward Whitney, aged 36, was the owner of that car, a standard vanguard. He had a long criminal record with 10 convictions for petty theft. Sitting in the back was John Duddy, a 36-year-old Scotsman who had been convicted four times for theft. He had been working as a lorry driver until he met up with Harry Roberts, aged 30, known as a hard man. He had recently been inside for some five years of a seven-year sentence for robbery with violence. In the seedy back streets of West London, he had beaten up a pensioner and cut a ring off his finger. 
a marksman in the rifle brigade, he had fought in Malaya during the emergency there. The army had taught him all about guns and how to survive while living rough in the jungle. Margaret, his wife, had told the police about his crimes when he had roughed her up after she refused to go on the streets for him. He had vowed revenge on her. Wormwood Scrubs in West London, near Shepherd's Bush, is where he had been imprisoned before being transferred to Horfield Prison in Bristol. There he was allowed to live in a hostel and go out bricklaying. He continued with this job when he was released, but got into debt and hurriedly left Bristol for London. There he quickly fell in with old friends from prison and met new friends who were ready for some easy money. Among them was John Whitney. They teamed up to steal metal and lead. From the pubs of London, they followed rent collectors and managers of betting shops and robbed them. John Duddy soon joined them, sporting a tattoo on his arm of a skull with the words, true to death. Roberts insisted they always had guns with them, swearing he would shoot it out with the police rather than go to prison again. That sunny August day, this trio found themselves here in Braybrook Street, near Roberts' old residence of Wormwood Scrubs, searching for a car to steal. Whitney's vanguard wasn't reliable enough to use on a job they had in mind. Whitney was driving, Roberts was next to him, and between them they had a canvas bag with three guns in it. The officers in the queue car felt suspicious about the vanguard. They flagged it down, and DC Woomwell walked over and peered inside. Suddenly there was a shot. David Woomwell fell, shot in the face. All he had done was to take out a notebook to write down the details of the car and driver. Roberts told Duddy to grab a gun and leapt out. He shot at Sergeant Head, who had been questioning Whitney, but missed him. Head ran back, shouting, no, 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 and tried to hide behind his car's bonnet. Robert shot him in the back, and he fell in front of the car. Duddy took aim at PC Fox, who was still sitting in the driving seat. Duddy's third shot killed him. As he fell forward against the wheel, his foot hit the accelerator. Fox's lifeless foot made the cue car lurch forward, running over Sergeant Head, who had still been alive. The rear wheels repeatedly crushed him. Smoke poured from the engine. Whitney, who had taken no part in the shooting, had got out to see what was happening. Robert screamed at him to drive them away. As they roared off, they passed a car. Driving it was Brian Deacon, a security guard. Deacon shouted to his wife to take down the number, PGT-726. Detectives impatiently awaited the tracing of the car number plate, but there was a hold-up. In 1966, there was no central register, and county offices shut at five o'clock. The Home Secretary, Roy Jenkins, came to visit the scene of the crime. A minute search for clues was initiated around Braybrook Street and on the Common, and officers from all over London volunteered to join the search. There was a sense of boiling indignation that such a Chicago-style shooting of policemen could happen on their patch, and they were pleased to be able to do something towards bringing the murderers to justice. The car's ownership was finally tracked down to John Whitney of Fernhead Road, Paddington. Detectives rushed to his basement flat. He told them that he had sold his car that day to a stranger in a pub for 15 pounds, and he had not been anywhere near Wormwood Scrubs. But his wife let on that he hadn't said anything to her about selling the car, and that he had been out all afternoon. By midnight, Whitney was in custody. 
Now the search began to find out where the car was hidden and its number was broadcast. The station was a hive of activity as evidence was carried in from his flat. Then came a phone call. The wanted car had been seen being driven into a lock-up garage in Vauxhall. Within minutes, the police were there. In it, they found three cartridges from the .38 Colt that had killed PC Fox. As they towed away Whitney's car to test it for fingerprints, he told them about Roberts and Duddy. He was taken to show them where the two men lived and both buildings were raided at 5 a.m. on the Monday, but the birds had flown. They had gone first to Hampstead Heath to bury the guns, and then they had split up. Duddy had gone home to Scotland, while Roberts had spent one night with his girlfriend, Lillian Perry, in a hotel in Bloomsbury, and then gone to buy camping equipment, including a sleeping bag. Now the hunt widened across Britain. With one of the trio already charged with murder and the other two identified, the police were confident that it would not be long before the pair were caught. There was a huge swell of public anger as press coverage followed every step of the hunt and reminded people of the callousness of the killings. When the Home Secretary visited Shepherd's Bush Police Station, he was urged to reintroduce capital punishment for murderers of policemen. Roy Jenkins needed all his tact when faced with angry hecklers. Well, I can well understand the reaction and feelings of policemen at the present time, but it would be quite wrong for me to take a major policy decision in the shadow of one event, however horrible that may be. As the day of the funeral of the murdered officers approached, a mountain of wreaths was sent, many of them by people who had not known them personally, but who felt moved to make some gesture. One was sent by the estranged wife of the fugitive Harry Roberts, Along with flowers, money poured in for the families they left behind. Determined to catch them without delay, the police decided to enlist the help of the public again. They issued detailed descriptions and warned that the men might be both armed and dangerous. The results were not long in coming, and on Tuesday, they arrested Duddy. They found him in bed in a Glasgow tenement in the Colton district, he gave in calmly, and by that evening, he was on his way back to London. An indication of how important the police rated the capture of Duddy was the decision to bring him back to London by aircraft. Very few criminals were given a trip in an airliner in the 1960s. Duddy had sat between two detectives, and Inspector Slipper took a statement from him on the plane. He reported that Duddy said, it was Roberts who started the shooting. He shot the two who got out of the car, and then he shouted at me to shoot. I just grabbed a gun and ran to the police car and shot the driver through the window. I must have been mad. It was not easy to get him off the plane so that the press photographers didn't get a glimpse of his face and prejudice his later identification, but the detectives managed it. At the police station, he added to his statement, I didn't mean to kill him. I wanted quick money the easy way. I'm a fool. But Harry Roberts was still missing. He had gone by bus with Lillian Perry to the edge of Epping Forest and there tenderly kissed her goodbye. She told the police all she knew and they were sure he must have gone to ground in Epping Forest. At dawn on Thursday, the 18th of August, there began the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. 500 policemen began searching the 6,000 acres of Epping Forest, backed up by dogs and tear gas. Unusually for England at that time, many of the police were armed. A helicopter hovered overhead, and officers from all over London and Essex volunteered to join in the hunt. 
For three days they combed the dense undergrowth for the gunman who had killed their colleagues, but they did not find him. The men directing the pursuit were soon convinced that he was not hiding in Epping Forest after all, so they withdrew the searches and widened the net. The police returned several times to addresses where Roberts had lived, but they could find no clues as to where the former jungle fighter had gone. Over 6,000 sightings were investigated most of them in London, but 160 of them in Liverpool, and over a hundred in Bournemouth. Interpol was alerted in 90 countries, but still there was no sight of Roberts. The man in charge of the hunt, Superintendent Richard Chitty, flew to Ireland to follow one lead that looked promising, but he soon returned empty-handed. A reward of £1,000 was offered on 16,000 posters. He was described as slimish with George Roby eyebrows. On the morning of the 31st of August, 19 days after the shooting, the road opposite the police station at Shepherd's Bush was filled with limousines. It was a day of a funeral that was as much a display of dedication as an expression of grief and sorrow. Over 600 policemen lined the route, and crowds braved the rain of the chill day in late summer to pledge their solidarity with the forces of law and order. As the procession wound its way through the streets of West London, a single piper played a lament in the courtyard at Scotland Yard. A week later, on the 6th of September, a memorial service for the murdered officers was held at Westminster Abbey. The Prime Minister Harold Wilson attended, and so did most other leading politicians of the day, along with members of Parliament and the judiciary. Most of the other members of the congregation consisted of 2,000 policemen from all over England. But soon a new sensation, the escape from Wormwood Scrubs of the spy George Blake, pushed the murder hunt off the front pages. As Roberts had known Blake in prison, some journalists wildly claimed he had engineered the breakout. As weeks passed without Roberts' capture, the police agreed at the committal proceedings that the trial of the other two men should start on the 14th of November without him in the dock. somewhat rueful Superintendent Chitty made another appeal. It's been a difficult investigation. The public, the police forces throughout the country and the world have been very cooperative. And uh, all I can ask is that the public will still send in these calls where they think they've cited Roberts, because um, that is one way in which he might be caught. His perseverance was to be rewarded. On the first day of the trial, a note was passed to him that Harry Roberts' hiding place had been found several miles north of Epping Forest, after all. A farm labourer who had been looking for small game with a catapult had spied a man in a tent. When he was questioned by a policeman about thefts in the area, he mentioned his discovery. The policeman and a colleague went to investigate and found a carefully built framework of boughs and branches covered with tarpaulin and plastic sheeting there was all the necessary equipment for a long stay. They watched for a day and night, but nobody came. However, the fingerprints they found there matched those of Harry Roberts. The fox had been sighted. A huge new search started for him in Thorley Wood, where his camp had been found. It was surrounded by policemen, many of them armed, and all of them confident. The 
they moved in at dawn, sweeping the landscape, eager to find traces of their quarry. Sergeant Smith and Thorne were looking in a hangar used for storing straw when Smith spotted a jar of methylated spirits. Pulling the bales apart, Smith found a primer stove. Behind another bale, he saw a sleeping bag. He gave it a hard prod with his rifle, and a sleepy, unshaven Harry Roberts emerged. Don't shoot, he pleaded. You won't get any trouble from me. I've had enough. I'm glad you caught me. As Roberts was taken into custody, police found a loaded Luger nearby, the one used to kill Head and Woomwell. News of his capture was relayed to Superintendent Chitty at the Old Bailey, who met him at last that afternoon in Bishop Stortford Police Station. Roberts admitted his guilt, but denied killing PC Fox. Harry Morris Roberts was charged with murder. That night he was taken back to Shepherd's Bush, just a short distance from the street where he had gunned down two policemen. A large crowd was waiting, hoping for a glimpse of this notorious murderer who had escaped the police net for over three months. His mother came to see him and at first failed to recognize him, all hairy and unkempt. She asked if the police had harmed him. No, he replied, perhaps with sarcasm, they have been the essence of kindness. It was decided that the trial of Duddy and Whitney should be stopped and a new one held for all three. At that trial, which began on the 6th of December, Roberts pleaded guilty to the murders of two of the policemen. Whitney and Duddy pleaded not guilty. But all three were quickly convicted of what Mr. Justice Glyn Jones called the most heinous crime committed in this country for more than a generation. The murderers of Sergeant Christopher Head and Constables David Woomwell and Geoffrey Fox received 30-year sentences.